Um, so I'm a civil engineer in North America, Bay Area, um, San Francisco. I work for Revamp Engineering. We do 14% of solar in the U.S. Um, last year alone uh, for the past five years. So, and I've been using and promoting QGIS to design solar sites since 2019 um, for some time now. And my talk is primarily about uh, issues that I've seen in civil site solar and applying those solutions uh, using Python. So with the expansion of solar across the world, terrain presents an increasingly common barrier to project development. Um, this is a site that we have in Hawaii. Um, and as you can see, there are a lot of undulations on the terrain. Um, as solar gets more and more popular, there is a lot less suitable terrain to install upon. And that runs into issues with civil engineering and uh, specifically Earthworks estimation, which is a large part of civil engineering, um, estimating and calculating how much earth we need to bring it out, out of a solar site. So I'll give you some background on the construction and development of utility scale PV. Um, primarily, my focus is in North America, United States, but this is pretty universal. So um, in order to understand PV construction, you have to understand PV site layouts. So this is a, the developers and engineers model the site. Um, as you can see on here on the right hand side, we have a map, cartographic map with a bunch of blocks in there. And those blocks are PV trackers. So um, this is a 2D model of the site. It's mainly made in AutoCAD or some sort of proprietary software such as PV design, PV case. You know, there's a lot more options out there. Um, but basically the idea is you will lay out the site uh, and place panels on inside of your project boundary. So these files are always geolocated and they're accompanied by shapefiles or KMZs and they show the locations of the trackers. And they are also usually accompanied by a topography DTM or public data. Um, and that could be also surveyed by a surveyor or you can fly a LIDAR drone and get topographic data and get a raster from that, usually a geotiff. So uh, besides that, we need to understand what a PV tracker is. So a PV tracker is what actually generates the electricity. This is the uh, PV tracker itself um, in the front view. Uh, and there is a pile structure uh, it, that is used as a foundation. So these are steel piles that are driven into the ground. And there's usually somewhere from, you know, like 50,000 to like 150,000 of these piles. So this becomes like a massive problem. And uh, you need to understand how to calculate the, the average height in order to estimate steel. And also you can see that it rotates. So it's called a tracker because it tracks the sun from east to west. And they're usually oriented north-south. There can be an azimuth, but usually in the US, we see them installed north-south. Um, besides that, there is the concept of linearity. So linearity is because there is usually a straight torque tube. So we see right here, this is the side view. You see piles and then you have a linear torque tube um, on, installed on top of those piles. So because of the constraint of linearity, we uh, have issues with terrain undulation. So I'll talk about this concept called like minimum and maximum reveal height. So in installation, uh, usually contractors and construction teams want to set a minimum height that this pile can be in a maximum height. Um, and these are chosen early on in the project development stage. And they're big cost adders and cost drivers because, as you can imagine, um, having a r large reveal window or having piles that are very tall can be very uh, costly um, when it comes to steel. So it's a balancing act between choosing a what we call a grading reveal window, which is setting a minimum reveal height and a maximum reveal height. Um, and that would kind of predict the amount of grading that you would see. So uh, having a minimum and maximum reveal height would 
constrain you in this sense that anything outside of the grading reveal window would either had to be cut or filled. So basically, as a civil engineer, that's our job to estimate and calculate the amount of cut and fill, that volume that we would see on site, and um, get that uh, final surface. So after we cut and after we fill, get that to the construction teams to actually go out and put that in their bulldozer and design that. So, um, yeah, that's the concept of earthworks. Um, so I'll show you an example of like what this actually looks like in practice and a uh, graphical representation of cut and fill for linear torque tube trackers for a one-foot reveal window. Um, this is a site, and you can see that there's a DTM in the background. This is, uh, uh, I think, just like a LiDAR TIFF that was surveyed, and um, there is representations of where the tracker locations are by the, these polygons in black. And then there's locations of cut and fill by green and red. So green would be where you'd be filling and red would be where you would be cutting. So uh, red is basically where we're cutting hills and green is where we're filling valleys. And you can see really well with the uh, terrain that you're kind of filling like this valley here and, you know, so on and so forth. And the representation does a good job of representing that. So the problem with the existing solutions, so specifically when it comes to earthwork estimation, um, PV-specific design software is very helpful, but it's often overcalculates and it's uh, kind of not accurate for earthworks estimations. Um, common software that's used is PV Case, PV Design, and Autodesk Civil 3D. Um, we use that very much as civil engineers. And that's kind of was standard practice for like a long time. And it was standard practice in my company until um, I kind of came along and I started looking at problems like this. So along with that, you know, they require costly licenses and they require specific training. So using Autodesk Civil 3D is pretty complicated. Um, even as a civil engineer, it's kind of like a learned practice. And you really need to apply yourself to like know what you're doing and know what you're looking at. So civil engineering work, detailed civil engineering work can be costly and it's time intensive. And, you know, in the field of solar, uh, time is money. And, um, you know, there's very intensive schedules to keep and the more money you can save, the better, especially working in construction. So a novel tool is proposed to quickly evaluate project suitability and associated impacts. And that tool is a little plugin I made called EarthCalc. So EarthCalc is a QGIS plugin for fast and easy earthwork estimates. Um, basically, the concept is that we would end with something on the left-hand side over here. And this is a visual representation uh, that is generated very quickly of the locations on a site where uh, cut and fill would be required. And because this is... So fast, you can uh, iterate very quickly and um, integrate it into your design very early on. So I'll show you kind of what it looks like. So basically, the inputs would be a LiDAR TIFF file. So this, is, this can be generated by a surveyor. You can actually have this information, or this can also be public data, you know, like any public resource that you have. In the United States, we have USGS. And you could just pull this USGS data and, you know, compile it, whether it's like LiDAR uh, and then create it into a TIFF and um, ultimately bring it into your QGIS uh, file. And alongside that, there are these PV trackers. So these PV trackers are polylines. They're tracker polylines. And usually you can import them and in the process of construction, specifically in the U.S., there's always shape files for these trackers. And it's basically something that a project developer will already have. So because you already have this information, it's kind of like a drag and drop situation where you can take these files and place them into Q QJS file. And then we have an interface. So it's this small interface that has a couple options. And I'll talk about these options here. So we can see that we can... Um, let me move over. So we can see that we have a GUI here, and there's a couple options. The first option is create points or points from layer. Basically, the concept is that we can use these polylines to 
basically create a database. Uh, it's this automated way to create a database based upon location of pile points. The way that that's done is a centroid is generated in the middle of these trackers, and this is because the tracker torque tube is always in the middle and it rotates. So there's like some math going on in the background to pull the vertices, generate a centroid, and then do some math to place all these pile points in the middle. Um, that's the points from layer option. So you would select points from layer, you would set your trackers at tra tracker polylines, and then there's also the option to select your terrain. So terrain is just a drop down menu and we'd select EG, which is just terminology for existing ground. And there's also options to set your minimum power reveal and your maximum power reveal, and um, also the number of piles per point. The number of piles per point is basically for every tracker, how many piles do you want to assume that we're going to have on the tracker? And it just places these equidistance apart from each other, it places it at the end, and then it has equidistance spacing in the middle. So by doing points from layer, we're creating this pile map um, on our site, and it's a representation kind of of what we would see at a construction uh, point. So there's also points from layer. And points from layer is important because that's kind of assuming that we're later in the stage of the project. And if you're later in the stage of the project, usually the workflow is that these tracker manufacturers will actually send you like pile points and the design's pretty locked in there. So if you use points from your layer, you can still use the tool. Um, basically any pile points you have, whether it's external, whether you inherit them from some sort of other project development team could be used and to be used this, to use this tool. So, and then it turns into something like this. Um, this option on the left-hand side is basically if we were to do points from layer and this is created from uh, these tracker polylines and the left-hand side is the representation of what the output would be. Um, it, can, it can help you inform design decisions. So uh, we actually get to a construction-ready design from this um, at my company, actually implementing this tool. So this is something that we actually use to design projects and um, we can see that there are portions here that are red. The red portions are actually where grading is occurring. Uh, grading being there's either being cut or fill on the site, and you can see that it matches pretty well onto the existing terrain. We can see that it's filling valleys and it's cutting hills. And this is just a representation of what we would send out to a construction team. Um, basically, this red surface is a TIF file that is a... Uh, tin interpolated from our algorithm um, that we apply to our piles database. And then we have this red that we'd send to construction and actually uh, have a solution there. So this is a visual representation and profile using the QGIS profile tool plugin um, of what that would look like in a section view. So this is the representation of cutting a hill and there's also representations of what would a black line being existing ground, red line being the proposed ground solution. And this is the option for filling a valley. So the advantages over existing solutions um, is that we can use PyGIS to simplify pre and post processing. Um, basically, this is just a bunch of processing plugins uh, uh, connected together and you can um, pre-process all your data there, and uh, it's automated in a way that it makes it easy to use, and these databases are created so we can use inside the algorithm. And it's easy to integrate inside of existing QJS and Python tools, such as like the profile tool. The UI increases the ease of use. Uh, the UI is really big for us, uh, especially this is a tool that we use internally and also something that we hope to increase adoption on, and the UI really helps people uh, get a grasp on it. and. There's basically minimal experience needed. And the concept of the creating the QJS plugin, it keeps inputs and outputs on one space. The database also creates additional opportunities for site analysis. And having these relationships and having this information in one database, basically it's plugged into a pandas data frame and you can work with that afterwards. Um, the algorithm is pretty simple. I'm sure you guys are familiar with like a linear regression. It's basically the concept of uh, best fitting a line to a data. Uh, 
you know, kind of these points here. And you can calculate this, uh, calculate slope, calculate intercept, basically what we're doing using the train. And this is some of the results are just a visualization of what we can get with the tool. And there's a couple symbology aspects to it integrated where you can see uh, actual values of uh, if you're filling six feet, if you're cutting six feet, and different graphical representations of that all within the QGIS symbology. Um, and that's also a profile of just using the database there. So the applications of it, um, we've actually used it uh, pretty consistently to increase efficiency and accuracy of our designs at Revamp. We, it's modular, modular meaning that there are different algorithms that we can apply and different solutions we can apply uh, depending on which team is using it. Development team being early stage, construction team being late stage, and actually sending that data to the field. There's 5x time savings. So this is a process that used to take us basically one to two weeks, and now we can get this down to around two days. Built-in steel length calculation, this is a big one. So because of the concept of piles, um, and creating a piles database very early on, we can calculate the amount of steel because of uh, basically we already have that data. We are setting piles based on their minimum maximum length, uh, usually at an average. And then because you have that database, you can kind of query it and get, gain some more information on where you're seeing steel cost, where you're seeing uh, more earthworks and help clients or internally make decisions to kind of change that up or down. The UI increases adoption. UI is very big. So we kind of had this externally as like a script that we'd had and people would have to go in and update stuff. And, you know, that's always kind of a pain when you have to have stuff in scripts and you have to teach people how to use it. So the UI increased adoption and that's great for us. So we'll just see a quick profile here of different kind of solutions that we have. Um, red being existing ground and we can see earth calc. Uh, and are also EarthCalc plus an engineered solution. So uh, this is kind of the concept of being able to apply different algorithms in this solution. Uh, blue would be early stage or um, having a concept that we could use more steel there. And then black would be uh, late stage construction, something or making the decision that we want to increase the uh, earthworks instead of the cost of steel. Comparison. So I'll just do a quick comparison here of... Uh, the results. So this is earth calc. Um, basically, after like our tin is interpolated and we generate a surface, we have these values of cut and fill and disturbed area. Uh, disturbed area is a big one, uh, 311 acres, and just keep that number in your head and just the visual comparison. So that's the tool. And then this is civil 3D. So civil 3D um, has 407 acres of disturbed area versus 311. This is a very big change. Um, I will say, though, EarthCalc solution is kind of conservative, um, and we probably wouldn't have something as, I'm sorry, not conservative, aggressive. And Civil 3D results are kind of conservative. Um, ultimately, we'd see something kind of like uh, this one, um, this EarthCalc plus engineering solution, something in between. So this is uh, all to say that we can kind of get these results in a very fast way, and we have a lot of benefit. There's a lot of benefits to be had by um, using EarthCalc. So why open source and why using open source? There's a variety of parties involved in design and construction of PV site, and having it be open source or having some sort of variation of our tool be open source helps everyone be on the same page. Uh, standardization facilitates collaboration. PV development occurs globally. Uh, this is in markets that Revamp doesn't participate in. So if we're able to get this tool out and have other people working on it, that's great for everybody. And ultimately, we all benefit from a cleaner future, which is a big one. Anything we do to make solar more widely adopted is great for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, so, are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, can uh, the can others try this tool in uh, like how, how can we try? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. The tools uh, publicly available right now. So there's like a variation of it um, on my GitHub, GitHub.com/slash Marco Alvarez Petito. Oh cool. And Thanks. you can download that. It's early stage, so 
um, the results that you would actually get would be similar to the beginning when I first showed it up. So basically, you have the uh, point representation, and there's an option to save out to CSV uh, as well. Yes. Are you planning on uh, publishing it in the plugin repository? Yes. Cool. Yeah. So within right. the next coming months, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Nice. More questions? Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Um, question is, uh, can you use this tool like the other way around to find suitable sites or move the the, uh, the polygons that you have uh, slightly across the train yeah. to see well, if, if you place it like 100 meters to that side, uh, your cost will be lower? Yeah, that's a great question. So currently, we don't have that option available, um, but that's a really great idea. Yeah, basically, the concept is uh, usually on early stage, um, there's this study done that is kind of like a maximization of PV trackers that you can place. So it's kind of like this packing algorithm. So we would probably start from an early stage design of trying to pack as many trackers inside our project boundary um, and then working from there. So kind of reducing the actual capacity of the site. Uh, so there's not that much sway to be made, but there is benefits to be had by actually shifting the panels and we've seen that so um, using this tool I guess so you would quickly iterate like with the concept of uh, you have this location and you can then see that it's not good so you can try to shift it over but I think that would be great if we were able to just you know do it on the fly great idea thank you more questions yes uh, are there any requirements to how detailed the elevation data needs to be for it to actually work yeah there's actually no requirement to, you know, basically is your solution is going to be as good as your elevation data. So if you have early stage stuff that's not very detailed, you know, you're going to see that on construction. So it's better to have that information well done early on, but the tool works really well with uh, pretty coarse data. So hmm. more questions. And like, like one meter, is that too coarse or too not? Oh, one meter is good. Okay. I would say one meter is pretty. That's high accuracy in my, in my case, yeah. Any more questions for Marco? Uh, great presentation, thank you. thank you. Do you ever have to consider any visual effects of these solar panels on residential? And maybe do you any uh, you do any analysis about that as well? Yeah, so usually the residential uh, constraints would probably be glare. Glare is a big one, um, and there's other tools in the market that address Glare. But the sites that we work on um, are usually utility scale that are very far away from uh, any residential. So it's usually in the middle of Texas or the middle of Florida. So well, good question. Yeah. Any more questions? If not, uh, let's thank uh, Marco for this nice presentation.